see um, the start screen now for our presentation, which is the University of Plymouth webinar for offer holders. As I said, it will be myself um, to, uh, speaking to you, um, but when it comes to everything uh, visa related, it will be my lovely uh, colleague Nina who will take you through the processes there. What we will cover within the next 35, 40 minutes or so um, is that we will be talking about the status that you're at, the stage where you're at the moment, the office um, that you might hold or that you will hold. Um, for the place here at the University of Plymouth. Then Nina will talk with you a bit uh, about the visa and will give you information on tips how to apply and what to keep in the back of your mind to make sure that everything goes smoothly. Then there will be a few tips and hints from me again as to uh, how to prepare for your travels, um, what to do when you arrive in the UK, how to make your way to Plymouth, and then also how to spend the first few days here in Plymouth. So uh, you have all been sent an invitation today because you have applied to the University of Plymouth, thank you very much, and because you are holding an offer to study with us in September. Depending on whereabouts in the application process you are, you either hold a conditional offer or you hold an unconditional offer. So I'm going to start with those of you, uh, or talking about those, uh, uh, to those of you who have currently still have a conditional offer. If you haven't done so yet, please, please, please let us know that you actually want to come to Plymouth this September. That means that you are accepting your offer. All you have to do, have to do is write us an email saying, yes, I firmly accept the offer. And then we know that you will join us hopefully this September. Some of you might still have some academic outstanding conditions. So we might still need to see the final transcripts or your final certificates. You might have an English language as a condition, as an academic condition on your offer letter. So as you fulfill all of these conditions, please let the university know so that we can do a little tick um, and make sure that we take those conditions off your offer. Um, there might also non-academic conditions like sending us the cover of the, uh, the picture of your passport. Um, so make sure that you have uh, sent all the information that we have asked for in your original offer letter. Now, once you've sent us everything, and once everything is fine and all the boxes are ticked, so we've got everything that we need from you, uh, we will send you an email which says, congratulations, you have reached a precast stage. With it, we will send you a link to fill in a precast checklist. And we also will ask you to pay your uh, original deposit. This obviously doesn't apply if you're sponsored, but what we would then need to have is a sponsorship letter from your sponsoring uh, buddy. Um, so once we then have received your precast checklist back and once we have confer uh, confirmation of your deposit payment, we will issue you the CAS. The CAS is the Certificate of Acceptance of Study. This is uh, the piece that you will need in order to apply for your student visa. And then hopefully you get your student visa back very quickly. And then as soon as possible, you should book your flights. Um, please note that we usually do not send an unconditional offer letter. So even if you have met all your academic um, conditions, uh, we normally will not send you a separate unconditional offer letter unless you need this for your sponsoring body um, or for some other reason. Please keep that in the back of your mind. And so when we're moving to those of you who are currently holding an unconditional offer letter, it might mean that you actually don't have that offer letter in your hand. It just means that you have met all of your conditions, that you are academically unconditional with us. And then you will again be sent that email saying congratulations and you will be asked to fill in a precast checklist and pay your deposit if it is applicable to you. And then again, you will receive your CAS and hopefully very quickly your visa back and then you can book your flight. You will hear this a few times booking your flights because it is already beginning of August and there's loads and loads of students when it comes to the UK, um, so there's a, that, that you know the prices will go up. So as soon as you possibly can, please book your flight to the UK. 
I'm not going to hand over to Nina, who's going to take you through all things visa. I do have to double check with Nina. Do you want me to flip, uh, to move the uh, slides over? I think so. I don't think I have the yeah. control to do that. Yeah. Okay. If you just want to say next slide, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Hi there. So my name is Nina. I'm the um, student immigration advice manager at the university. I will be just going over some key bits about applying for your student visa from overseas. So most of you will have um, an agent. So applying from outside the UK, the University of Plymouth is unable to give you specific advice, individual advice when applying from outside the UK. Um, a number, most of you will have an agent and your agent will be able to advise you on the visa process if that's what they are there for. If you don't have an agent yet, you can look at the University of Plymouth's um, agent page and see if there's one listed and you can contact them. Um, if there is no agent listed and you're applying on your own, um, you can either apply for independent advice from your home country. Um, but if that fails as well, you can always contact us and we'll try our best to help you. And our student immigration advice email will be given to you later. Okay, next, please. It's lagging. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, so as Anna's suggested or mentioned, you can apply for the visa once you've met all the conditions of your offer. Um, and you, let's just jump forward and say you've got your CAS and you are now at stage to, to apply for the visa. Without the CAS, you cannot apply for the visa. So this is the most important thing to receive. You must have the financial evidence for your living costs and tuition fees before you apply for your visa. So I'll go into that in a bit more information. Educational documents. Now, you don't actually have to produce your educational documents again for the visa application, but you must have them to hand in case the UKVI caseworker asks to see them. A few things here to be aware of, any evidence of any gaps in study. Uh, we've had some refusals um, when there's been a big gap. So, for example, you finished your, um, say, your education, high school education, maybe 18, and then you might have a gap of three years or five years or longer where you have not been studying. So the Home Office are very hot on this area. If there is a gap, they will say, question if you are a genuine student or why is there a big gap? So we do recommend that if you're applying for a visa and there has been a gap, you can actually um, attach a letter just to explain why that gap was. So for example, um, you might have gone off and, and gained employment somewhere and now decided to re-educate to go and uh, enhance your career in a different direction. So, so it's perfectly acceptable to have a gap. Um, but if you can provide a letter up front with your visa application to explain why the gap was there, that would be excellent. That would save the Home Office having to contact you to try and ask for this information. You obviously must have the money to pay for your application and the health care surcharge, which I'll go into on the next few screens. Some students might need an ATAS application. Now that is for, well, only applicable to certain subjects, the students stu studying at postgraduate level, for example, a uh, master's in mechanical engineering. Um, your CAS will clearly state if you need an ATAS. So just look at the ATAS, uh, your, your CAS to see if it says yes, if it's needed. And we do suggest you apply for that as soon as possible. It's currently taking six weeks to apply for the ATAS and you can't apply for the visa until you have the ATAS granted. So please do not delay if you need to apply for the ATAS. TB certificate, some countries need to have a tuberculosis certificate before they come to the UK. Um, so if you've been in a country for longer than six months, there's a list of countries on the UK website. And if your country is on there, you'll need to get a TB certificate. Please don't forget to include it with your visa application. I was at home office meeting in London last week and um, quite a few applications were refused because the TB certificate was not included. So just have a quick check on the, you can just Google 
do I need a TB certificate for the UK? And it will have a list of countries and it's a very simple thing to organize. So don't forget the TB. Okay, next certificate. Next, next slide. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Certificates everywhere. Yeah. Okay, so evidence of living costs. If we go into that now. So you can see from this table, we can't give you specific examples on tuition fees because you will most of you will have varying amounts to pay. But for the undergraduate student, you can see that your fees would likely to be between 17 to 18,000 pounds and postgrad will be a bit more. So the UKVI require you to have £1,023 per month living costs for a maximum of nine months. So that comes to 9207. Very odd figures here. We still don't know exactly how the figures um, have been arrived at by the Home Office, but they are the figures at the moment. They're likely to go up next year, um, but this year these are the figures that you only need to, to look at. So if we have an example down here, once you've paid your three and a half thousand pound deposit, say if your fees were 18,000, you've paid your deposit, so you only have 14 and a half thousand, I say only, it's still a lot of money, but you have 14 and a half thousand left in tuition fees. If you then add on the living costs, the 9207 I mentioned, you will need to have 23,707 in your bank account for 28 days. So this is the amount you need. So please check your CAS for the exact tuition fees because as I say, they will vary. This is just an example. But on the next screen, we'll just break that down a bit. Okay, so if you're a self fee payer, so you're using your own bank statements, the money needs to be an accessible personal bank account for 28 days prior to you submitting that visa. If you have the money in there for 28 days, but it goes down, even below uh, by equivalent of 10 British pounds, it's not enough. Your visa will be refused. So you've got to make sure there's definitely 28 full days, definitely the minimum amount required for 28 days minimum. The financial document must be no older than 30 days. If you are financially sponsored, if you're lucky enough to get money paid to you to help you with your studies, then you will need an official letter to support your studies. Please allow for fluctuations in currency. So we do have some students from countries where the currency can be a bit volatile in its value. So instead of getting you know, 22,707 in your account exactly, you know the your own uh, currency from your home, home country, how volatile or not volatile it is. We would suggest you have a buffer zone so that if there is a big drop in currency value, you will be safe. Otherwise, you'll have to start again at the 28 days, which you could delay the start of your studies, and it might prevent you from studying at all in the UK. So please allow for fluctuations. If you are using a parent or guardian's bank statement, so a fair few number of students do use this, there was extra documents you will need. So you need a consent letter from, from your parent to say, yes, we allow our son or daughter to access all the money in the account for student purposes, for living costs and tuition fees. A birth certificate to prove that you are the child of the parent or a legal document if you're using your guardian um, and the personal bank statement must be in the parent or guardian's name. Now, um, the bank statement, it can't be a, bank, a business bank statement. It's got to be a personal bank statement. It can't be in stocks and shares. It can't be in a pension account. It's got, the best way is just to get it in a straightforward, simple bank account where it's obvious the money can be accessed. Um, they have sometimes, sorry, Anne, if you go back a little bit again, yeah, sometimes with the legal guardian, um, it's, it's trying to prove that you have a, a legal guardian can be quite difficult from some countries. Uh, what's acceptable, like, for example, a statutory declaration in one country uh, to say that your guardian um, is not acceptable in the UK so sometimes 
um, there can be questions about that. But your agent that you are using will have experience and they will know which documents are acceptable from which um, countries. So please um, take your agent's advice on that. And obviously, if any documents are in a different language that needs to be translated. OK, thank you. So educational loan, for those of you who are accessing a loan, it, the, the loan has to be from uh, an official government or an official educational loan scheme, um, no, dated no older than six months. And the loan must be payable to the student. It can't be payable to the parent or the legal guardian. Um, it's got to be payable straight to the student. And if the student loan only covers, say, part of your living costs or fees, then you'll need to put um, extra money in a bank account in addition to the student loan. And again, official translations. OK, thank you. So the cost of applying, it's not cheap, as you're probably already aware, um, but the standard application fee is £490. On average, it is three weeks to process. So you really do need to plan um, if you're having to apply, apply for an ATAS or TB certificate, or you're waiting for 28 days for money to be in your bank account. Um, you know, take into account the fact that it can take three weeks to process from overseas. You can pay extra. You can pay an extra £500. Most visa application centres have a priority option. Uh, and it can be as quick as five days to process. Now, when it's nearing to the enrollment date of your new course in September, um, you might have to pay extra to get this faster service. Most courses, well, all courses have a latest enrollment date. Um, so, you know, if you are having difficulties with delays, please contact us, let us know in advance, and we'll be able to step in and, and advise what to do. The IHS, the Immigration Health Surcharge, so paying this amount will allow you to have access to free healthcare in the UK. Um, certain things you'll still have to pay for when it comes to eye care, say hearing tests, dental treatment, you still have to pay for, which is the same as, as us, as, as British citizens. Um, but for all the other really essential care, you, you'll be very well looked after with the, on the NHS but you do have to pay £776 per applicant for each year of leave granted. So if you uh, were applying for a three-year degree, it's three lots of 776 and most students will get a four-month wrap-up period at the end of their uh, visa, so that tips over into part of another year, so it might be another small chunk of the IHS fee to pay. So it is a lot of money to pay up front, um, you can actually, there's a QR code there, you can go in and type in your details and it'll give you uh, the cost of your IHS fee. Um, when you apply, for, when you're going through the visa application itself, um, it's all part and parcel of the application. So you pay your IHS fee, it will tell you how much you have to pay, you pay there by bank card, and then once you've paid that, then it goes on to the application fee. So it all has to be paid all together at the time you're applying for your student visa to, So you need to make sure you've got all this money available and accessible by bank card when you are applying. Okay, so tips for your student visa. Um, check your passport. Now this has actually changed. So this the passport does not need to be valid for the whole of your stay, but it does need to be valid for when you enter the UK. So if you're applying for a visa early now, just make sure your passport is still valid by the time you want to enter the UK. If it then if your then passport expires, say six months later, that's not a problem. You can apply from within the UK through your own government um, or your embassy based in the UK. So that's slightly uh, wrong at the top there. Um, we've already said about make sure you evidence gaps in study. Put money in your bank account um, than the needed. I've already said that. You will be questioned also if there's a large sum of money in your account. So be prepared to show where that money came from. So if you're using a bank statement and the opening balance says zero, zero, and then suddenly 30,000 pounds goes in, 
the UK VI case caseworker will look at that and say, where has that money come from? Is that money genuinely the students or have they borrowed it from a loan company? Um, you know, they will question it. So our advice is for the bank statement, make sure the opening balance is the high amount to start off with. So it covers the 28 day period. Um, but if you can't do that, then again, include a letter to say, this money has come from family and you might even want to then um, add the bank statement or the family member who's given you the money. Um, so it's just actually preparing yourself and adding this extra information. If you don't, the Home Office will write to you. So why not give them the explanation to start off with? But my strong advice would be just to make sure the opening balance is at the higher high amount in the first place. Okay, um, make sure all documents are clear and on official paper. So bank statement, if it's not looking official, it won't be able to be, be used, obviously. You can apply up to six months before your course start date. So obviously you can apply now. Um, and credibility interviews. The university itself, we do our own in-house credibility interviews. You might have already been invited to a meeting with our credibility team. Um, but the Home Office themselves uh, will most likely do credibility interviews with you as well. Make sure you check your junk emails because sometimes a request for an interview will go to your junk email. Uh, and if you don't attend the interview, you'll get automatic refusal. And it's not um, seen as a genuine reason that you did not see the email. So again, just look out for your um, in the junk email. And here on that QR code is a set of credibility interview questions. Uh, just examples, we, you, you know, we can't um, uh, coach you in, we're not allowed to coach you to uh, reply to these um, questions, but please do. It will give you some handy tips on how to get through that interview. Okay. Bring independence with you. That's been a really uh, popular question this year. So hopefully most of you will realize that from the 1st of January this year, rules have changed. You can only bring dependents with you if you're on a research degree. So in other words, a PhD or a research-based higher degree, like a Res M. Or if you're in receipt of an award from a government. Um, so for example, if you're a postgrad student and you are fully financially sponsored, then you can bring dependents to. Undergraduates can't bring dependents at all, no matter what situation. Those already in the UK, that's slightly different as well. If you're in the UK and you've already, already had a, got a student visa and you've got dependents already, then yes, most of the time that is, is permissible as well. But anyone in the UK can come directly to our, our student immigration service, just to clarify that. Um, but just to reiterate that only if you're a PhD student or a research student, or in fully um, financial sponsored students studying postgrad degree. Again, there's a QR code to the, the most recent rules. Okay, so preparing to travel, there's a, um, I think my colleague will go into more information here, um, but obviously, um, there's quite a few things you need to prepare and to pack and uh, documents. As far as your visa is concerned, when you're traveling to the UK, always have a printout of your CAS, or your offer letter, um, your passport, any documents really just in your hand luggage so that if you are questioned when you come through the UK border, you've got it all easily accessible in a neat file. And then you can just say, there you go. Um, unlikely to be questioned, but it's always best to be prepared. Okay. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Nina. I saw there were loads and loads of questions being asked. So thank you, colleagues in the background, um, answering them. So it's now up to me again, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what to expect in the next few weeks and months until you actually arrive here in Plymouth. 
Um, so um, as I have said already, once you get your visa back, um, your passport back with the visa in it, do make sure that you book your flight as quickly as possible. And also, and I'll speak, uh, talk to you about this later a little bit more in detail, try to get a flight into London Heathrow, um, because this is where we have coaches picking you up, but also it is the most accessible of all the um, of all the uh, London um, uh, airports uh, to us. So um, please also make sure when you book your flight um, that it is within the dates given in your vignette, which is that sticker that you receive in your passport. You have to arrive during that time that is given in, uh, in that vignette. Um, so if you haven't done this yet, I would definitely uh, recommend that you look at, look at some key dates um, for your arrival here uh, in September. Now, the first one that I want to point out is the 9th of September, uh, which is a Monday, and it is the official beginning of the International Students' Welcome Week. So this is a week where my colleagues in student support have put together a range of variety, a uh, variety of um, events, uh, of sessions, of lectures to help you finding your feet here in Plymouth, to give you a little bit of a head start to all the other students who arrive a week later. Um, so on Monday the 16th, we will have a freshest week. So this is where all other first year students arrive. Again, there's going to be a lot of activity on campus and it's definitely something that if at all possible, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't uh, miss. But also the 16th of September is the beginning of induction week. Now this is the academic induction and you really have to be here in Plymouth by all means possible. Um, Nina has mentioned there are some late arrival dates, um, but if at, at all possible, really, you should not miss your academic induction week. Um, and then the actual uh, teaching sessions, the actual lectures, seminars, that will start yet another week later on the 23rd of September. As I said, I would really love for all of you to be here um, for the International Welcome Week because it will help you to settle in and give you that head start, as I said earlier on. If you miss the uh, Welcome Week, there will be a settling in event uh, a little bit later um, in the term on the 7th of November, where we will repeat some of the things that will have been uh, done uh, during the International Welcome, uh, Welcome Week. If you haven't done so yet, I would definitely recommend that you take a look at our um, virtual tour. I'm going to try. There we go. You should see. No, you cannot see the virtual tour because hang on a second. Right. Forget about this. Uh, this is what I said earlier about techni uh, technicalities not really always being my strong points. So if you put virtual tour into the University of Plymouth search box um, on top of our website, you will be directed also here with the QR code directed to the virtual tour of Plymouth. Uh, which will give you an idea of all the teaching facilities, um, of the location of other important things. Um, and it just will help you to familiarize yourself a little bit with what will be your home for the next either year or for the, you know, uh, the next three years. So it is just nice that when you arrive here in Plymouth and you say, oh yeah, I've seen that, build, uh, that building already. Oh yeah, the campus looks familiar. Yeah, and it just, as I said, um, try, you know, try to go onto onto the virtual tour. It will it will hopefully make you very excited to come to Plymouth. If you haven't done so yet, you definitely should start looking into your uh, accommodation. Um, as an undergraduate student um, with the University of Plymouth, if you're firm with us, you would have been able to start looking into university accommodation from the moment you have firmed your place with us. So I guess that most of you who are undergraduate students will already looked into accommodation. Generally speaking, there's two kinds of accommodations available. One here are the university managed halls of residence, and then we have the private accommodation. The university managed halls of residence are only really available for undergraduate students. 
um, and uh, they vary in price depending on whether you have your own bathroom, so an ensuite room, or whether you have shared facilities. So they do start at £128.50 per week. Those would be for shared um, uh, facilities, but they do go up unto, up to you know 200 and a little bit more um, per week. One thing when it comes to your budget planning to keep in mind is that your rent will include all utility bills. So gas, electric, water, Wi-Fi and everything will be included. What's not included is food and also your TV license is not included in that. Uh, but those aren't, especially the TV license, it's not a huge expense that will come towards you. Also included in the uh, rental price will be a weekly cleaning of communal spaces. And of course, there is 24 hour seven security available as well. So as I said, if you haven't done that yet and you aren't undergraduate students, I very strongly recommend that you go on to the student portal, accommodation portal and apply for university managed um, accommodation. Private accommodation is available again in two forms. One would be private halls of residence. So it's the same setup like the university managed halls of residence, it's just that they are not managed by the university. Also, the difference is, is that they are also available for postgraduate students. Um, so they have more flexibility with regards to uh, the term that means the weeks of your rental agreement. Um, so that's one option that you would have, again, for either undergrad or postgraduate students. The other option that you would have would be to live in what we call shared student houses. So those are normal, typical uh, residential houses, normally within 10, 15 minutes walk from university. And those houses have been converted into student flats. So you would have your own room um, and you would share the common rooms. Uh, the common facilities, the common areas with five, six, seven, eight other students. You would have to arrange these kind of accommodation through private letting agencies. There is quite a number of those on campus and around campus. I can't give you a name because I can't favor one over the other. But if you just put uh, student letting agents Plymouth into Google um, or you know any other search engine, there will be a list of agencies that come up with. Um, and again, I would definitely recommend uh, arranging your accommodation before you come to Plymouth. Um, if you uh, take out a private tenancy, then I would recommend that you make use of the University of Plymouth Students Union. They have a service where they basically check uh, your tenancy agreement and make sure that everything is the way that it should be. All of the accommodation that we have in halls of residence, but also in the other student lettings, would normally be for single occupancy. Nina has already said that some of you might want to bring and are able to bring families with you. If you do so, you have to be aware of the fact that you will be competing with local tenants as well. And there is a shortage uh, of family accommodation across the UK and so in Plymouth as well. So we would definitely very strongly recommend that if you are bringing your family to Plymouth with you, that you come as a student by yourself first, you go into temporary accommodation that can be a B&B &B, um, or a hostel or that kind of thing. And then whilst you're here in your temporary accommodation, that's when you look with the tenants, uh, with, the, with the rental agencies, trying to find appropriate accommodation for your family. So really, if you are coming with your family, come first by yourself, make all the arrangements for your family, and they can then travel later to Plymouth. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to pack your suitcases. That's not really my job. And I'm very sure that all of you will have had uh, packed a suitcase once or not twice in your lifetime. Um, but I just want to bring a few things to your attention that you might not really have thought about yet. First of all, check whether you're actually allowed to have hold luggage. Nowadays, you can book really cheap uh, uh, flight tickets and sometimes they actually might not even allow you to bring a hold luggage with you you would have to book that separately so if you haven't done that yet and you already have booked your uh, your, your flight double check what your luggage allowance is um, and if you are about to book your flight in the future again as I said just double check the luggage allowance now whatever luggage you bring 
please keep in mind, you will have to carry it and transport it to yourself. So even if you're allowed to bring, you know, a, a suitcase that is 30 kilos, picture yourself lugging that suitcase around the train station, around Plymouth, you know, around the airport. So make sure that you can actually lift it and move it yourself. It seems obvious, but I myself have learned it the hard way and have done my back in on several occasions when I overpacked. Keep all your valuables and your official papers, as Nina said as well, in your hand luggage. That is very important. So have a paper copy of the offer letter, the cast of everything that there is, which is uh, which is official. Um, don't rely on your mobile phone because we all know when it's really important, that's when they die or the battery runs out. So make sure you've got a hard copy of all the important documents with you in one place in your hand luggage. And also bring a warm jacket in your hand luggage. A number of you, and I can see from where you have uh, joined us today, uh, you will be arriving from warmer climates and you will be arriving into the British, the end of the British summer, which can mean anything. Now, uh, for those of you who experienced the British summer in the past, they will know it can be wet and cold, but it also can be warm. But just to be double sure, pack something warm at hand for you. There is absolutely no need whatsoever to bring anything like linen, bedding, kitchen appliances, crockery, you name it. Our, our campus, as you hopefully will have seen already, sort of is in the city centre. So literally, it's a stone throw from all the shops where you can buy all of those things. Um, and there's also charity shops available throughout the uh, city centre where you can buy, you know, secondhand and nearly new items at very, very uh, discounted prices. So really do not worry too much about bringing things which are not really essential in your luggage. What is essential to bring is, if at all possible, a preloaded uh, payment card or an internationally accepted credit card to use whilst you're waiting for your UK bank account to be opened and to have issued you your, your credit card. In contrast to maybe some of your countries um, of origin, uh, cash is becoming less and less fashionable in the UK. You just go around and you tap your card and then you get the shock at the end of the month when you see the credit card statement. Um, so we are moving more and more towards a cashless society. And the campus itself here in Plymouth is a cashless campus, which means that we normally not only accept uh, credit card, debit cards, preloaded cards. Um, so if at all possible, make sure you've got one of those cards with you. Another thing you definitely should bring with you and enough of with you is a supply of your medication if you're on any prescriptions. We would normally say two to three months, if at all possible, should be in your luggage. Um, you will be registered with a GP here, a doctor, but they might have to assess your medical needs before they can prescribe you any new medication. There might be a delay in getting exactly the kind of medication that you need, and there might also be different brands, and so they might have to look for substitutes. So just to be on the safe side, please make sure that you have two to three months of your prescribed medication with you in your luggage. Last but not least, bring something dear to you that reminds you of home. There might be a moment in your first weeks here in Plymouth when you feel a little bit left alone, a little bit homesick, and maybe just holding something or looking at something that reminds you of home might help you just to come over that very, very hopefully, very short moment of sadness. So once you arrive in the UK, um, if you arrive, as I said, during uh, our, uh, our welcome week, we will have a bus service picking you up from Heathrow Airport. At the moment, we have buses for the 9th and the 10th of September at 11 o'clock. I heard that they are booked out and so my colleagues are putting on more buses. You will need to pre-book onto those buses and you will receive a lot of information prior to then arriving in the UK on how to make, uh, how to find my colleagues who are picking you up and how to make your way through uh, Heathrow Airport. The buses will depart from Terminal 2, but as I said, there will be, there will be advice on how to find uh, the buses. 
Um, it will take about four to five hours to get to Plymouth by bus because there will be breaks for you, um, you know, so that you can stretch your legs. Um, uh, we will have some refreshments on board for you. It's not a three course meal, but it's something that's going to keep you going until you actually then get to Plymouth. And the bus will take you straight into uh, the Plymouth City Centre onto campus where we will then have student ambassadors waiting for you to arrive and they will also help you uh, with uh, your onward, you know, your onward, uh, it's not really travel, but movements to your accommodation. There are other ways of getting to Plymouth, of course. Unfortunately, Plymouth itself hasn't got an airport anymore. Um, so most of the people who travel on a regular basis will uh, fly in and out of Heathrow because it just seems to be the most convenient and most accessible of the big airports for us. You can either then take a coach directly to Plymouth or you take the train into London Paddington, which is a train station. And then again, you can take a train to Plymouth. You can get into London Gatwick, but please keep in mind, it will add about an hour, an hour and a half to your journey. And if you're coming already from a 10, you know, 12 hour flight overseas, you might not want to add these additional one, one and a half hours uh, to, to your journey. Also, you would have to na navigate your way around uh, uh, London, uh, the city of London, and going from one uh, underground station to another. So London Heathrow, as I said, is the most accessible of the London airports for Plymouth. There is an airport in Bristol, which is about two hours away from us. Um, it's mostly regional flights. Um, so flights within Europe that arrive into Bristol. Um, and there you can again take a coach that will take you directly into, into the Plymouth city center. We have mentioned Exeter here as well, um, but Exeter is even smaller than Bristol and so even more regional um, than Bristol Airport. One thing I want to say is if at all possible, try to book direct flights. If you are booking connecting flights and especially connecting flights in Europe, please double check whether you need a transit visa. Some countries, even if you never leave airside, will ask for a transit visa. So the Netherlands, for instance, if you want to go via, via Amsterdam, just double check, make sure that you're not stuck somewhere. And also, please let either my colleagues in the halls know if you arrive later than 2100 at any given uh, day uh, so that there is someone there to meet and greet you from security. And if you are booked into private accommodation, please let your landlord and your hall know uh, of your estimated time of arrival in Plymouth. Just again, as I said, to make sure there is a friendly place welcoming you. Um, there are 10 important things that we have listed you should do when you arrive. I'm sure there's 20, I'm sure there's 50, but those we believe should be the most, uh, we believe to be the most important ones. First of all, of course, let your family know that you have arrived safely. You can do this once you touch ground in London or somewhere else in the UK. Remember, it's going to be very costly um, if you make phone calls with your home SIM card. Um, so we will have SIM cards available for you when you arrive here in Plymouth. So you might want to wait um, if, you know, uh, if you do want to let your family know um, that you have arrived. Of course, you should check into your accommodation, make sure everything is as it should be. Get your keys um, and then start decorating your room. And then very much the next thing you should do is come to our welcome lounge in the Royal Marquis here on campus, which is going to be the hotspot for all of the activities organized during the Welcome Week for international students. So really come by, check in, see what's on offer, make friends, ask questions, um, and be helped to find your feet in the first few days of your, uh, of your uh, time in Plymouth. You'll need to collect your biometric res resident permit, um, and you also need to complete your right to, uh, to study check. Then you need to complete your online enrollment. Please note, you can only do the online enrollment when once you're actually physically in the UK. Every year we have students saying, oh, I can't enroll, and they're trying to do this for, whilst they're still at home. You can only really do this once you have arrived here in the UK. Um, when going back to the key days that we had earlier, the uh, second week uh, that we have here, the week the 16th of September is when your induction, the academic in the induction starts. Um, and as we said, you really should uh, attend uh, this induction schedule uh, if at all possible at all. 
Manchester Bith University Medical Center, you can do this online. Um, so it's a very easy thing to do. Again, my colleagues uh, during the welcome week will guide you what to do. Open a bank account. And then last but not least, make sure that you actually do have some fun as well. Attend surgery events, make new friends, enjoy being in Plymouth. You might be lucky, we might have a little bit of sunshine um, and you might go outside and enjoy the beautiful surrounding um, that we have here in Plymouth. And also make sure that you visit the Students' Union, which is a physical space here in Plymouth uh, on our campus, but it's also your voice, your rep representation uh, here at the university. As I mentioned, the role marquee um, would probably be your first place to turn to during arrivals week. It will be open every day from Monday to Sunday during the international arrivals week. So there will be my lovely colleagues uh, will be there as a first point of contact with any kind of questions that you should have. Um, they will be uh, pointing in the direction of all the uh, services, support services that are available for all of our students. Um, and uh, there will be also student ambassadors um, and other staff members sort of ready just to help you with any, any given question that you might have. Um, there will also be events organized, social events, as I mentioned before. Some of them might need signing up, others you can just drop in. So do make sure that you familiarize yourself with the schedule of the International Arrival Week. This is still in its final stages of planning. If you go onto our website in the next few weeks, you will find an updated version of the actual events uh, schedule. Right, last but not least, a few additional tips or information for you. Um, you might find it useful to download the University of Plymouth app. Until yesterday, I didn't know that we have a University of Plymouth app, but apparently there is a lot of things that you can do with it. Not only keep up to date uh, with anything that's happening on campus, but you can also access your timetable and other things. So yes, please, uh, once you have your uh, University of Plymouth um, uh, students, you know, student number, or not student number, but email address as well, make sure that you download the University of Plymouth app. I think I have mentioned it earlier, um, we have a wide range of support services available for you. Those are learning support, this can be personal support, can be financial support. The one thing you need to do is to make sure that if you feel that you need help, is that you seek help. And if you do not know where to find the help that you need, go to the Student Hub, which will be your first point of contact. We have invested a lot of time, colleagues, into putting all those support services together for you. So please make sure that you use them. The Students' Union as well is there to help you during your time here in Plymouth. If you find, for instance, that within a few weeks or into your studies, you haven't found the right friends, um, you, you can't really talk to anyone. There's something we call buddy scheme. So they will put you, try to put you together or put you in contact with other students who've been here longer that might help you, you know, finding, finding your ways a little bit. Um, and generally speaking, the Students' Union really, in addition to the Student Hub, should be a first point of contact for you. There we go, we've got two happy students uh, who are currently with us. They are happy because they are smiling, at least that's what I believe. Um, they are just two students, international students, one here from India, another one from Nigeria, um, that are part of our international student community where we have more students from more, more over than 100 different countries in the world. And as I said in the beginning, we had 60 different countries registered for this event today. So when you arrive here to Plymouth, into Plymouth, you're not going to be the only international student. You will be surrounded by hopefully a large uh, a group of your home country, of your uh, uh, cultural environment, but also experience new, you know, new cultures as well. There will be loads of different profiles on our website from our current and past international students. So when you've got a moment, take a look at them and see what they have to say about their experience here in Plymouth. This is just a legal thing, basically telling you that whatever we said was correct at the time that we were saying it. So if there are any changes to anything, uh, please do not hold us responsible for it. 
And I leave you with um, just a few um, places where, or you know, links where you can get a bit more information. Um, I do believe that it's very important for you to keep up to date with what is happening. So go onto the website, uh, look into the social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever that is. Um, and if you have specific questions, please do not hesitate to ask us. Uh, we are here to answer your questions. So with this, I'm going to end the yeah. slideshow. And and, Anna, um, yeah. Do you mind if I just add a few extra things? At the no, end? of course. Go yes. ahead. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just going back to visas a moment. Most of you will get a BRP card still, but some countries will receive an e-visa instead. So I know we keep saying about BRP cards, um, but if you uh, read, when your visa is granted, you'll be sent uh, an email and it will tell you exactly what you will receive. Um, most students will just get a BRP card. Um, some will get a BRP card and an e-visa, and some will just get just an e-visa. Now, for this intake for September, majority of you will have a BRP card, but don't worry if you just get an EV, so that, that's great. Um, there's, there'll be nothing for you to collect from Plymouth. You won't need to go to the post office to collect your BRP when you arrive. Um, for those who get the BRP card, don't worry if the expiry date on your, on your BRP says the end of December 2024. Um, the letter you receive is the most important thing. That will show your actual visa end date on the letter, the time you've been granted. If that's not been the right time for you, if there's a mistake, um, then please contact us as soon as possible. Um, but it, assuming that that date is all correct, when you then arrive in the UK, you will receive another communication from the Home Office before the end of December, just to give you um, instructions on how to switch into the e-visa. Everybody will be e-visa from 1st of January 2025. So it's a bit of a change that um, the Home Office is going through at the moment. But the main thing is that um, when your BRP card says December 24, don't panic. That's perfectly normal. It's the letter that has the correct end date on it. Um, also just wanted to say that... Um, some students asked to transfer or change courses once they've arrived in the UK. That is almost impossible to do. So please make sure that you're 100% confident with the course that you have chosen now. And if you're having doubts, contact the application department now, it, just in case it can be done. But if you're thinking you'll get here and then change, Unfortunately, it's not that easy because the visa you are granted is a University of Plymouth visa for the exact course you've chosen to study. So if you want to change to something else, you might have to even change your visa or leave the UK and come back in again. So just make sure you're 100% happy with the course you've got. And I also want to mention about late enrolments. Um, Please don't travel. If you think you're going to be late because your visa has been delayed or the flight's been delayed, and it's, it, you know, it might not be your fault at all, but if you think you're going to be late, just please keep in contact with us and your faculty just to say what's happening. And don't travel to the UK until we've said that's fine. We'll allow you to arrive 10 days late. Um, please let us um, give you that permission first. Otherwise, you might travel to the UK border and they will then turn you away and say, no, you're too late to start. Um, but please just keep in contact. Because we you know sometimes late arrivals are nothing, nothing to do with, with you. It's out of your control. And don't travel before you're allowed to. So you'll in your passport, you will have a vignette sticker in your passport. And it's usually a 90 days uh, window. And you can actually travel within those 90 days to the UK. If you travel before or after, um, you will either get turned away at the border or you will be entered incorrectly. And then we will pick it up and then tell you to leave the UK. So it's really vitally important to travel just within those vignette dates. 
And last of all, um, my colleague Tiffany has put, already put in the uh, Q&A a session that my team is running tomorrow at 11 o'clock till 12. And it just goes through how to apply for your visa from overseas in a lot more detail. So we've only just gone through a few slides here. So if you're, you are available tomorrow at 11 o'clock, then please click onto that link. And it's just a, like an additional help. It doesn't, won't give you individual advice, but it's just additional help um, with your visa. And, and that's Gina, it for me. <laughs> it's not just it's not just tomorrow, but you hold those uh, those sessions on a regular basis, don't yes, you? Yes, we do. Um, so let's just see when the next one is. Yeah, the, the last one for this year is the 14th of August. So the link that Tiffany's put in the Q&A will take you to the link of all the dates. Um, you don't have to. Uh, you might be happy that your agent's given you all the information you need, but it's just in case you, you want to come to that, please do. Right. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Um, the uh, colleagues who've been working very busily in the background answering questions, were there any questions that we should bring forward uh, to be talked about, answered here in this forum, on this platform? Hi, Anna. Hi, Alana. <laughs> Some people have been asking about reading lists and induction and that sort of thing. And there is a link actually yeah. on the website. You can get all of that information. You can see what your induction program is going to look like. I'll put um, I put the email. I can put it. I'll put it in the link. I'll see if uh, can get Tiff to share that with everyone. Yeah, I can see that someone's asking whether we can, uh, whether you can watch the recording later. Yes, we have recorded this session and it will be sent out to all the uh, people who have registered for the session. Um, and also you will receive a PDF form of the slides. The slides will look different to the ones that I have presented, um, but the content is more or less the same. It's even more into detail than what I've gone through. Uh, so you will receive both the recording and the slides as well. Right. I'm just looking at a few questions as they're coming up now. Um, so can I provide that's a question about the guarantor in the UK with regards to accommodation. Um, who have you got here from accommodation who could answer that question? Rebecca, are you happy to do that? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, if you've booked private accommodation, then it's likely that you will need a UK guarantor um, or to provide the rent up front. Um, yeah, the university um, on the website, there's um, a page called Living in the Private Sector. And on there, there's um, a section about your guarantor, um, which basically is a service for international students who might need a guarantor. It is a paid service, but it, it helps the students that don't necessarily have a UK guarantor. Um, I will find the link for it and I'll put it in, in the chat. I would suggest having a look into that one. Thanks, Rebecca. There was also a question about right to study. Um, so the right to study is when you arrive in the UK, the university, every university has to check your immigration documents to make sure you have the correct immigration lead that gives you the right to study. Because sometimes students might apply for something else in error. Um, now that right to study, the link, it was done online. The link will be sent to you uh, by email a few weeks before you arrive. It might go in your junk email, so look out for that. It's a personal link to you. It will have your student reference number on it. Um, and it will either be from UKBI Reporting, which is the university, or from someone called Adam Smith it might come from. So if you look into your junk email, if you can't find it uh, a few weeks before, you can access it, but you can't complete it until you are in the UK. When your feet are in the UK, when you've landed, you can then complete that right to study check. And that right to study check, if you don't do it, you'll be blocked from enrolling. So it's an important thing to do, but don't try and do it from overseas because it won't work. Right. Are there any that I, I just looked at some of the uh, some of the questions that have been answered and are still in the process of being answered. Some of them relate to admissions. Um, Ellie, um, Rachel, can I confirm that if students have specific questions relating to their uh, to their CAS or to their application, shall they put into the uh, use of general applications email, but put 
into the subject webinar so that you know that it has come from this from this round. Ellie, there you are. <laughs> Hi there. Hello. Yeah, that would be perfect. So any specific questions about your application individually, if you can email applications at Plymouth.ac.uk. And if you put in the subject webinar, I'll uh, make sure those get prioritised and answered today. Thank you very much. Anything else that we should answer here? Any other questions that are worth mentioning to be brought? There we go. Emma? Anna, thank you. Thank you for your time today, everybody. I just wanted to say we are looking forward enormously to welcoming you here on campus at University of Plymouth. And honestly, I moved here two years ago. It's a really beautiful city and it's a really beautiful location and everyone is really warm and welcoming. So we are really looking forward to seeing you and welcoming you. Thank you, Emma. I think we all agree with that. Well, I moved 20 years ago and they couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> so there's something about this place. Well, they haven't ejected you yet. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. And as we said before, uh, we are very, very proud of having a very strong, lively international community here on campus. We have students from over 100 different countries um, and they are playing such an important role here at the university, but also in the city of Plymouth, making it a very multicultural place, a much more multicultural place than it was when I started 20 years ago. So, yes, we are really very much looking forward to, to, to welcoming you to Plymouth. Any other questions or shall we leave it at this friendly note? If right. anyone has any last minute questions, they're very welcome to email international at plymouth.ac.uk and we'll look into it. I know we might not be able to get round to everyone today. Right. I can see that Joshua raised his hands. Josh? Oh, apologies. Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There we go. No hands raised there then. Okay. Right. Thank you, every, everyone who has joined us here today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, my colleagues, uh, for being so supportive of this event as well. And I hope you're all having a nice morning, day, afternoon, evening, night, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you very much indeed. And I hope to see you all soon here in Plymouth. Thank you all.